also today, Diane Eswine is our recycling coordinator for Amherst, and, uh, and that's quite a job. What, what does that all entail? What do you have to do during the year? Well, basically, my major job is to uh, write the grant. Uh, curbside recycling is financed by a grant from the county, and my responsibility is to write that grant and make sure we get the money to do it. We, we get about $125,000 from the county to, um, to do our recycling program, which is primarily the curbside recycling, and we get that money from the county, and the only way we get that is to write a grant and get it accepted. And this, uh, this affects all our bills, doesn't it, in, in Amherst? The sure. We don't, nobody in Amherst pays for the recycling p program directly. You don't get that on your BFI bill. It, it's... Um, you know, you probably pay for it in your taxes, but taxes that go to the state and are returned to the county and are returned to Amherst in the form of a recycling grant. Um, Amherst pays BFI $2.50 per month per household uh, for them to come and pick up the, the recycled product. So it's important that uh, the people in Amherst get their money's worth by putting their blue bags out on the curb. You know, that's we're paying for it it's important that they use that service. Ah, so there, that's, it's a front end, back end thing there. Um, it, you cannot not recycle, because after all, you're paying for it, so make it worthwhile there. Right. So, uh, Diane, uh, now that we have the main man here, Jim Davis is with us today, and uh, we're gonna take a little tour through the factory. I'm sure that there are some questions that you have, and something that maybe the viewers would be very interested in knowing more about uh, in participating in the program, what maybe they could do to help facilitate recycling and uh, making it just a little bit easier to do so. Right. I think primarily one of the important things we have to understand is why th why we do it. Uh, what is the uh, what is the goal that we're trying to achieve by going to the extra trouble of uh, putting things in blue bags? Well, Diane, there are several reasons why we should recycle as residents in our communities. The main reason is that it is a resource, a valuable resource that we are trying to avoid from throwing it into the landfill. The state of Ohio established back in 1988 rules and regulations that mandated that every solid waste district, and in Lorain County, that's the Lorain County Solid Waste District, establish a goal that would reduce the dependency on landfills. They found that there is a scarce resource and landfill availability and the airspace that uh, uh, exists and also in the cost of landfilling. They also determined that there's a very valuable resource that typically as users of product we throw the wrappings, the, pa the packaging, and the containers away. Those materials are extremely valuable, and we want to be able to capture that, put it into the right form, and send it back to the manufacturing process uh, so that it can be reused. The, the three R's of the program are basically reduce, reuse, and recycle. The reduction is an educational part of the program whereby the consumer recognizes what type of packaging and the products that they purchase will minimize the waste product that they have to uh, dispose of. The reuse, again, minimizes the waste and the ability to uh, uh, fill that container that you're going to put on the curbside that will go to the landfill. The recycle, again, does the same thing. Recycling of home post-consumer products is, uh, I, I think, an integral part to saving the valuable resources such as trees. Uh, it's the, well known that a five-foot stack of trees or of newspapers can save uh, several trees uh, it, because that's what it takes to remanufacture that much newsprint uh, that can, versus just taking that stack of newsprint and throw it in a landfill. Same with corrugated cardboard that's produced uh, as a byproduct of the manufacturing process in commercial and uh, uh, industrial operations. So the concept of recycling is to save airspace in the landfills, extends the landfill expectancy uh, and the life expectancy that uh, we all desperately need to conduct our daily activities. Also to capture a resource that 
really we are losing if we put it in a landfill. We want to use that, put it back to a better use so that we can in turn save natural resources that exist throughout our country, such as iron ore, aluminum uh, mineral products, uh, and also uh, trees used in the pulp production for paper products. Uh, glass is the same thing. All of these materials are easily recovered, easily recycled, easily put back into the processing of uh, our consumer needs. So uh, now Diane has brought uh, along, and I, I <laughs> we'll, we'll pretend it's from home, okay? And uh, and you keep quite a clean home, I see. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to find out uh, exact now. Now with these milk jugs, I've been I see the commercials that have come up on TV. They're making them stronger with less plastic. Uh -huh. uh, this, uh, this is some kind of technique that maybe came through recycling that this kind of a thing was developed. Uh, I'm not sure of the uh, technology used, yeah. but with the uh, uh, high density polyethylene, which this is, uh, they're able to injection mold particular products that are able to have a greater strength. Um, they, the polymer technology today is certainly uh, far superior than what we had 10 years ago even. But uh, suffice to say that this product, when it gets recovered, put back into this bag, brought to this facility, sorted, baled, and taken to a, another process facility where it's broken down, ground up, cleaned, and then melted into a, rare re a raw resin product, will most likely end up in some type of other container uh, not used for human food consumption, but used as uh, an automobile part, um, a bumper on a, a car, for example, or some other type of curb stop, or... Is, is this how they store it? We were looking at this earlier yes. here. So it's just stored in a pellet form until they decide how to they use it? They will actually grind it down. I believe we have a sample here of the flake. This is from uh, the colorized products, which would be dish detergent bottles, the butter dishes, things of that nature, uh, shampoo bottles. They make a, a flake out of it. They then take that flake, once it's been cleaned, they will melt it back down. It goes through an injection process, which then is pelletized. The injection uh, stream is chopped up into pellets. This particular mix was a high-density natural resin such as made from this type of product, it was colorized in the injection process and there it has the ability to be placed back into an injection machine and made into a toy or some other useful product. Now Diane here, we're going to make use of you as the recycling coordinator there. Do you have some questions that could maybe help some, uh, some of the neighbors there uh, to better recycle on how to clean certain things and get them prepared? Yeah, I'm particularly concerned. I've always heard that when you throw a bottle like this away, you're supposed to take the top and, mm -hmm. and, and not use the top because the top's different kinds of plastic, is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct from the standpoint uh, that is a different type of plastic. However, in our process, the plastic caps really don't cause the problem. The problem is when you place this into a bag, you're taking up almost one cubic foot of airspace. You take this off and compact that, you can get probably seven of these and the airspace in your bag that you just had one container. Oh, I see. Also, in our collection process, we use compactor trucks. And a lot of times, this is going to be placed into a compactor and compressed. When you have a cap on it, that becomes a projectile. So for safety purposes, we like to have those projectiles removed because you've got compressed air blowing that cap off. Okay. Uh, it minimizes the risk to the collector and the processor. OK, the other question I had was, you know, here's a detergent bottle. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I put the detergent bottles in the same bag I put that? Yes. Uh, the beauty of the blue bag collection program is to make the process as simple as possible to the homeowner. Every recycled product of a rigid nature can go in the same blue bag. Now, if you look on the bottom, you will see there are certain numbers. Every plastic container will have a number with the recycling triangle around it. We collect number one and number two plastic containers. Those are primarily the ones that we process at this facility. And I would urge everyone to follow the directions set forth by their local recycling program because some do vary as to what's collected at the curb. What happens if I put a, a different number in there? 
uh, we will do the sorting here. And unfortunately, if you place a, a, an item in the blue bag that is not in our recycling list, it then gets pulled out, placed in the trash, and goes to the landfill. But the cost of doing that at this facility costs more for us to process and the cleaner the material, the lower the cost of processing that we have to deal with. So it's a good idea to rinse these bottles out? Well, the rinsing is a good idea for one thing only. It doesn't hurt the process here if there's a food contaminant or dried milk on it. But as a homeowner, the last thing I want is a half carton of, dry, of, of stale yeah. rotten milk in ooh, my, uh, ooh, boy, in my can out in the, in the garage or in the, uh, the utility room. So for a homeowner aesthetics, uh, it's best to clean out and rinse the materials. It keeps the bugs and things out of your uh, your storage container until you put it out on the curb. Okay, so you told me that I should put all the plastics in one bag, but here I got some newspaper in this bag. Mm -hmm. Is that going to cause a problem? Again, depending on your curbside program, many of our communities, we have separate uh, vehicles or, and in some cases separate compartment trucks where newspapers is placed in a separate container on the truck. Now, in your particular case um, and, and others, there is a one source collection program. Our mechanical equipment here allows us the ability to separate that newspaper. Once this is debagged, the newspaper is separated through a mechanical uh, conveying system. Uh, so we do have the technology at this facility to separate that newsprint from here. But again, that has a different cost attached to it than if it's placed on the curb in a separate pile and goes in a separate bin on the truck or collected completely by a different truck. So I urge you to review your program with the residents of Amherst and let them make the determination. Okay, so what you're saying is if I mess up and put paper in a bag, it's not going to cause a lot of problems, but you right. would prefer that I separate my paper and my plastics. Uh, I have to ask that you review your collection program, and I don't have it right in front of me, oh, okay. but your collection program may dictate that they pick it up separately. Uh, I think if it, it does. goes in here, it wouldn't kill us, but on those programs, there's a different price structure submitted to the community where those uh, the newsprint is collected in a separate bin or a separate truck. Okay, so and I'm pretty sure in, in Amherst we're supposed to separate right. them. I believe so. But like I said, if I make a mistake, it's not going to cause a lot of problems. The equipment. What about glass? I had somebody call me and ask me about the colored glass and mm -hmm. not picking up green glass or something. And I think I'm. You can put. Is that another separate bag, or can you put no. it in with the plastic? The glass uh, can go in the blue bag with all the other rigid materials. Uh, we collect glass, clear, brown, and green, and we hand sort in those three color uh, varieties here at the facility. So if it's mixed, it doesn't bother us a bit. We do that sorting here at the plant. What about the wrappers? Uh, the wrappers on the bottles that you might see here, uh, is it good to take it off? What will happen, no, what will happen when this is processed, again, with the cap off and flattened, it will be diced up. It goes through a flotation system, which will actually, because of the density of the plastic, will float certain plastics at a level, and the other materials, such as the wrapper, will just be washed off as a process of the cleaning methods. Oh. So it really doesn't affect it at all. Like uh, making steel slag and exactly. coke and the Same rise concept. and fall. Now the same thing with glass containers uh, and, and alum steel cans or aluminum cans. Uh, personally, I always scrape the labels off the steel cans just because that's what I like to do. It looks shiny. Uh, <laughs> but it doesn't affect the process because once that can is smashed, put in a bale, and that bale is placed into a large melting pot, that paper burns off rather quickly. Well, in a few minutes, what we're going to do is we're going to take a good look here at uh, the facility through some of the uh, reliefs that we have, some of the maps, and, uh, and we'll also get a chance to go outside here and really hear some noise and see how it's actually done. But before we go, Di, is there anything that you would like to say to the uh, people of Amherst uh, and, uh, and recyclers all? I just think it's mostly very, very important to cooperate with the program, I, you know, to try and get those blue bags out. We're not going to continue to get our, our recycling grant if we can't prove that we're using the money efficiently and effectively. So I think that um, 
it's incumbent upon the, the people of Amherst to, uh, to be involved in the program, one, so that we don't clutter up the landfill too much, and, and two, so that we retain our recycling grant and can prove that we are uh, using that money wisely. Well, then it only seems to make sense, and it saves dollars dollars and cents. Uh, I think that wraps that end up there. We'll be back in just a few minutes here and we'll take a look at the facility. It's going to be quite exciting, so stay tuned. Uh, I thought before we go too far here, we really should, uh, a lot of people don't know where your refuse, where your recycling takes place. And I thought that uh, maybe Jim could give a, a brief uh, background on the facility that we have in our location in the county. Okay, Michael, our facility is located just east of the city of Oberlin. And we're located right off of what's now called Overland Elyria Road, and it's the old U.S. Route 20. And what we are uh, act actively doing here is both landfill operations, recycling operations, yard waste composting operations, and wood processing operations all on one facility. So we're a comprehensive program. Now we have a relief map here, pretty much shows in, uh, in quite a bit of detail on uh, what the situation is here. And we'll take a scan down here and we'll have uh, Jim describe the, the situation for us. Well, looking at this model, if you focus in on this little turquoise block, that is a recycling building. Uh, this facility is in direct dimensional contrast to the entire landfill operation. As you can see, it's a small part of the entire land area that uh, we conduct our activities on. However, it is a large building. Um, if you are coming up Route 511, you will turn east on Oberlin Elyria Road, proceed past the uh, tire facility and the local Ford Motor um, uh, dealership and into our landfill entrance. The Lorraine County BFI uh, landfill entrance uh, turns in a northerly, direct, a northerly direction where you would proceed to pass the gates and you at that point will come to an intersection. There is a drive that directly goes to the left. That drive will take you to the recycling and the wood processing and mulch sales uh, area. Now the recycling center, uh, I personally can bring my own things here to the recycling center? Yeah, we do have a drop-off operation right at the front of our building. You would enter into the re recycling facility driveway. Uh, that's the Lorain County Resource Recovery Complex drive. And there is underneath our uh, front porch overhang is uh, located several containers whereby you could do drop-off of your recyclable materials. Um, the material that you would bring to the landfill, however, you do have to enter into uh, the landfill entrance just east of the recycling facility entrance. We do have citizen drop-off operations whereby residents can bring a variety of solid waste materials, materials that can't be recycled, and we do take those in our citizen drop-off uh, box areas. And you would proceed across a scale house uh, entrance and they would take your uh, order process uh, there is a payment required and then they would direct you to the location to place your materials for disposal also uh, we do sell mulch materials here uh, retail and anyone can come in with a pickup truck and drive away with uh, several yards of mulch at a, a very reasonable price um, if you enter the landfill entrance and proceed straight in a northerly direction, it will take you to the scale whereby you would go across for landfill disposal. That operation is primarily isolated and use four large vehicles. So the, we direct the small residential and private pickup trucks to the recycling area for both recycling and solid waste. The larger trucks, the commercial operations, go straight back to the landfill across their scale. Now our whole landfill, how many acres do we have right here? Currently we're processing material and sited under about 15,000 uh, acres, and, or 1,500 acres, I'm sorry. As a result, um, we have enough landfill space sited for many years into the future. The, the goal of the Lorraine County Solid Waste District was to have 
uh, a cap placed on this. There is a limit to what can be brought into this landfill on a daily and on a yearly basis so that this landfill is scheduled to last right now I think up to about 15 years with the areas that's currently permitted. So we have the capacity to service the Lorain County needs for quite some time. Uh, we also operate a compost facility so that the yard waste materials that are collected throughout Lorain County are also brought to this facility, uh, processed through a grinding method and composted by a turning uh, activity with our heavy equipment and that material is then screened and sold back to uh, landscapers, nurseries and private individuals that wish to come in and purchase small orders of compost. Now these aren't just big holes in the ground that uh, you just sort of scoop up, throw trash in and throw trash over. What, what's the process? Because I see the, you see the build up here and it's almost like a, a, in a way like a little pyramid. Uh, but what, what is the process and, and how deep is it? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, the, we excavate approximately 10 acre cells. So we'll do 10 acres at a time and what happens we're based here on a very heavy, thick clay uh, soil condition. We will excavate 40 to 50 feet down, and in that pit would be placed a liner, a plastic liner, a uh, synthetic liner that will prevent any leakage into the uh, subgrade. We sort of like a pool. It's basically a sealed pool. And on top of that, we'll place uh, a layer of uh, compacted clay and on top of that there will be a water collection system placed that will capture any rainwater or material or liquid material that may de be deposited into the cell as it's being filled with solid waste. Uh, those collection systems and that network of piping will take that water to a storage tank uh, system whereby it's stored and then taken by truck to a wastewater treatment facility so we do manage all liquids that get into the landfill in a proper manner. Now as material is placed in and compacted in layers each day uh, a daily cover of material is placed over that layer of compacted solid waste. We use a combination of what's called a posa shell which is um, like a paper mache material that's sprayed onto the material and after several lifts then we are required to place uh, six inches of compacted soil on that material as well. So it's built up in layers and as it continues to build up once we reach the final grade then the entire landfill cell is capped with the like material which would include a, um, a synthetic liner which again prevents moisture from getting into the materials and also then capped with clay uh, and provided uh, a topping with topsoil and then seeded with a vegetative cover. And, and, uh, and I'm sure it looks just as good as it does right here, but this is not a compost. This is not going to disintegrate in any way other than what nature takes its course over thousands of years? No, what you end up having in a landfill scenario with today's best available technology is basically a sealed tomb for solid waste. Now we do have gas extraction systems which collects the methane gas, to it uh, funnels that gas to a particular location and our plan on this site is to install a gas burning turbine system which will generate electricity allowing us to run our operations and also sell that electricity back to uh, the, the neighboring uh, communities. Well, I hope we'll get a chance to uh, go out and see a little bit more of this as we go along there. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes and we're going to take a look at the facility right here out on old uh, US Route 20 here in Oberlin at the BFI recycling facility and see uh, it goes from you, from me, to here and we'll see how it, uh, how it gets placed where it's supposed to go onto its next step into being uh, recycled and back into useful product. And there's a number of people employed at the BFI recycling facility here and, uh, and that is an approximate number of... We have about 85 people working here full time. Is it like a, a three shift, a two shift kind of a we, deal? Well, Mike, we run two 10 hour shifts here, uh, five days a week and we'll work on Saturday based on the volume of incoming material and it has a seasonal impact on us. I see. Now this is the facility here and if we take a look down, uh, Jim's going to briefly describe for us the process of how it comes in and how it goes out. 
Okay, well, first off, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a driveway that goes underneath the porch overhang of our facility. That's where we have our located uh, containers for drop-off recyclable materials. People can drive right up in here, go underneath the uh, porch, and put their material in. And we have a lot of families that make it a family event to do just that. You'll see children out there putting the containers of glass and cans in the various uh, compartments of those drop-off containers. Those drop-off containers are then taken by our trucks back to our tipping floor. And this tipping floor area is accessible through the scale house, so everything that comes into this facility is weighed. And that's a requirement of the Ohio EPA. So our commercial trucks uh, bring the material in here. They're directed to a variety of doors. We have four large bay doors on the east side of the building. Uh, the, d the vehicles, depending on what they have, uh, will be directed to the particular door where that material will be placed. The skid loader operators inside will then take the material, shove it to a variety of uh, in-feed conveyor systems. We have four processing lines throughout the facility. Uh, line number one is our most automated line. That line is where all residential materials, the steel cans, the glass products, the aluminum, and the plastic is all processed on line one. Line two typically will be where we process our newspapers and a variety of other blue bag materials, uh, providing uh, depending on the actual volumes that we're dealing with on a, on a particular day. Lines three and four are our heavy commercial and uh, industrial processing lines. This is where we place our corrugated cardboard and wood pallet loads. Uh, loads such as what's generated from Lorraine Ford Motor Company come and are placed in this area and processed where we pull out wood pallets and corrugated cardboard products. Uh, the materials are stored uh, from the residential lines to the storage silos and in containers below. Everything in this facility that is sorted uh, for recycling purposes is pushed to a floor conveyor. We have two floor conveyors and those conveyors will direct that material up to our horizontal baler. That horizontal baler is the heartbeat of this entire plant. Everything, excluding glass, is baled in this facility. Uh, corrugated cardboard, aluminum cans, steel cans, office paper, newspaper, plastics, all items are baled here and then directed to a variety of uh, storage docks, and shipping doors where waiting tractor trailer trucks will be loaded and then that material is then taken to the end use uh, mill or uh, plastic recycling facility or glass cullet uh, reprocessing facility. And some of the major facilities in uh, our part of the country are located? We have uh, mills up in Canada that we ship newspaper and corrugated cardboard to, and a, a large majority of our material goes to the state of Virginia where there's uh, an abundance of uh, demand for uh, paper products uh, for both corrugated cardboard and newspaper there as well. We've at times shipped material all the way to Mexico, uh, a lot to the East Coast. Most of our plastic products end up going by truck up to the state of Michigan for a processing facility up there. I see. Well, and now comes to the exciting part here. Recycling is not a once a week, put it on the curb in the blue bag uh, situation. I mean, it's gotta be an everyday deal that's going on. I mean, every day you're drinking your pop, every day you're drinking your milk, you're tossing your trash, your newspapers. So every day you've gotta be cognizant of where this stuff is going to go and that's why we have recycling and uh, you know I can harp on this I can go on and on and on but you're not going to pay attention to me you're going to say oh guy in a black shirt with a tan no he's not a recycler so we want one better hold on recycle man everybody's got a gimmick we got a gimmick we have recycle man now there's nothing half stepping about this this guy you're going to see over the course of the next year, uh, giving you little uh, tips on how to recycle and where to recycle and why you should recycle. 
for Cycle Man. I'm looking forward to seeing quite a bit of you in the next year. By the way, you ever been on a date? Look, I think you got big potential. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm talking about more than just the feet. But, uh, but we have a recycle man. So, uh, you know, I, I really think Mobius that being the BFI mascot, being Mobius, I think that's a very important position that you have right now anyhow. I think there's one recycle man and one Mobius. I'm sure you understand. Here, let me catch that door for you, okay? It's been great seeing you. And, uh, and take your time. We'll talk to you later there. Say hello to the wife. <laughs> she wouldn't happen to have a sister for Recycle Man, would she? Well, we'll see you. And we'll see you. in Lorain County. It's right here to the BFI Recycling Center and the BFI facility. <laughs> what, a, what an amazing thing when you really look at it. And to think that maybe one of the highest points in the county is right here at the BFI facility. Wait, i got to say goodbye to one of our new friends, okay? Hold on. Recycle. Reduce. Reuse. A lot today. We've learned about recycling. We've learned really how it all gets here how it all gets done. I'd like to thank everybody that made today possible. Uh, first, Jim Davis, who's the vice president and uh, the chairman in charge here of recycling at the BFI Recycling Center. I'd like to also thank Diane Eswine, our uh, auditor for the city of Amherst, and really our project coordinator, uh, our recycling project coordinator for the city of Amherst, and really everybody in Lorain County. I'd like to thank you for uh, the Pride Day and for also uh, taking care of your neighborhoods. And really, it shouldn't be just a one day at a time thing. It should be an every day at, the time, at a time thing. That we should all take care to keep, keep our areas clean. For WACC, this is Michael Beatty, your roving reporter from the BFI facility in Oberlin. Thanks. Reduce, reuse, recycle.